This tape recorded June 30th, 1969. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tom Kutzer of WISL with a guest on the sports show. I had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman a few years back during the Shemokin Centennial. He has been known to all of us here in his hometown, Shemokin and Cole Township. But now, in this year of 1969, he is well known throughout these United States. His name, Mr. Stanley Kowaleski, one of the baseball Hall of Fame greats. 100 years ago, Stanley Kowaleski, a native of Shemokin, Pennsylvania, was on top of the world. He had just pitched the Cleveland Indians to their first championship, winning three games in the World Series to become a national hero. But the triumph was born of hard circumstances and tragedy. Indeed, to reach the pinnacle, Kowaleski twice had to escape intense darkness. The first time, the darkness was literal. He needed to break free of the hard scrabble life in the Pennsylvania coal mines, where he began working at the age of 12. Years later, free of the mines and in the prime of a major league pitching career, he endured in 1920 a devastating one-two punch. The unexpected death of his 24-year-old bride followed just a few weeks later by the death of a teammate, the only baseball player in the game's history killed by a pitched ball. With those two tragedies fresh in the air, Kowaleski in 1920 poured himself into pitching through the pain. He led the Indians to the American League flag in a tight three-way pennant race, then capped that off with his World Series heroics. That performance, part of a brilliant 14-year career, propelled Kowaleski to a place in baseball's Hall of Fame. And to think, it all began in Shemokin. Kowaleski came from the middle coal fields of the anthracite field uh, in the town of Shemokin. And what's strangely coincidental is that the industry he started working in as a 12-year-old breaker boy was very, very similar to the industry he entered as a professional baseball player. And what I mean by that is that both the coal industry and the baseball industry were dominated by entrepreneurial owners bent on their own wealth and accruing more wealth at the expense of the working man and his working conditions and his salary. What's better? Uh Playing baseball or uh, being at a breaker? Well, listen, I worked for I worked from seven in the morning to six at night, six days a week for three dollars and seventy-five cents a week. So I'd rather play baseball. I don't think the union was in then, huh? <laughs> we had our own union then. Us, us kids used to go on a strike. We didn't always strike just to get one day off. I think Stan's background uh, was fairly typical of guys who played the turn of the century, early early twentieth century, that. Um, they came from coal mines, a very poor background, a lot of immigrant parents, and some of these guys were first generation or second generation Americans, so there wasn't a lot of opportunity except in the mines. So you went to Pennsylvania or West Virginia or Southern Ohio, and you became a coal miner, and you worked uh, six days a week for ungodly hours, and that was your life. But luckily for Stan, he uh, just for, for the heck of it, as I've written a million times, he uh, when he had a little bit of daylight after the coal mines, he'd throw rocks at tin cans. He got to be really good at it. I understand when you were a young boy, when you first uh, started to have the great love for the sport of baseball, uh, you played right here in Shemokin. Was it Bunker Hill? I played at Bunker I played, or practiced at Bunker Hill, but the only games I played was Springfield. And five games that I win that ball. And you got your control by throwing the throw stones at rocks at a can on, on a tree. I used to swing it, even hidden swinging. I should have tried that about 20 years ago. <laughs> when did you get your first break in, in big league baseball? Well, I got it with Lancaster in the fall of 1980. You know, I was never out of Shemokin before. I was never on a train in my life. When I went to Lancaster to eat in the hotel, I was so bashful, I used to sneak away from eat hot dogs in the side street. What really impressed a lot of these scouts would be speed. And Kowaleski was not a power pitcher. He was a control pitcher who threw a fastball, a curve, a change of pace, and of course, the spitter. Throughout the years, what would you say, do you think would be your best pitch? Well, I, you're all good pitchers you can pitch in the right spot at the right time. <laughs> I understand well, you were good at the spitball. Well, I used spitball, but I didn't all use it all the time. I had them looking for it. 
But if they're looking for a spit boy and you throw something else, you'll have no trouble with them. You've got to mix it up a little you bit, right? Mix them all up. Right. Once baseball kind of changed from a sport where you were trying to, you know, just pitch to the batter and get your exercise and have guys hit it to a sport where you were trying to deceive the batter and make them swing at bad pitchers and make them swing at, uh, you know, miss the ball. Um, you know, you're obviously looking for, for different ways to, to get guys out. And it's one of those, those perfect storms of the evolution of baseball, that kind of trial and error of, of everything. And Kowalski, I think he said he was kind of middling around in the, the minors and ended up picking up the, uh, the spitball. And, you know, just the, the psychological aspect of that um, is, is phenomenal because, you know, you always think it's going to come. And, you know, he goes and says, I didn't always throw it, you know, but just having that in the back of their minds. Not many people know that Stan Kowalewski's major league career began with Connie Mack in the A's in 1912. And Connie Mack had every intention of keeping him. Now in 1912, Mack had a rotation of Gettysburg, Eddie Plank, Chief Bender. He had pitchers that were phenomenal pitchers, so there was no way you know, he would keep a youngster like Stan Kowaleski, but he did have plans for him. And he sent him to Spokane in the Northwest League. And there was an agreement between the Spokane owner, because the minor leagues functioned independently of the majors at that period of time, that Mac had dibs on him. But then the Spokane owner ran into financial difficulties and he had to get some cash and his team was going south too. So he wanted some players as well. So he traded him for five players and money to Portland and disregarded, you know, Max rights to him. Now, had that not been done, he might have come up through the Philadelphia Athletics. Stan continued to find success in the Pacific Coast League, this time with the Portland Beavers. After only one season with Portland, Kowalewski would quickly get the call up to the majors by the Cleveland Indians. Originally, Cleveland's plan was to use Stan as a relief pitcher, but due to an injury to Ed Kleffer, Kowalewski would land a spot in the starting rotation for the Indians during the 1916 season. The, the team that he came to was interesting. The Indians, they had a new owner in Jim Dunn who bought the ball club in 1916, and he promised everybody in Cleveland he would bring a winner here. But he was interested in guys like Kowalewski. And immediately, he wasn't a superstar, but they could see the potential right away. And the big thing was he had the spitball. And each year, he got better. And uh, by 1920, he was one of the top pitchers in the game. Even though Stan was on top of the baseball world, his personal world came crushing down when tragedy struck early in the 1920 season. On May 28th, he received the heartbreaking news that his wife of seven years, Mary Stivitz, had passed away. Although she had been sick for some time, her death was quite unexpected. Stan returned home to Shimokin for a short time. Then after a few days, he returned to Cleveland to get back into the rotation for the Indians. Although his thoughts surely remained in Shimokin, Stan powered through his grief to help the Indians lead in the standings. Yet, as the team found itself in the conversation for the American League pennant, Kowalewski and Cleveland would experience another fatal blow later in the season. It was a dark, rainy day in August, and the Indians were in New York to face the Yankees at the Polo Grounds. That day, Cleveland had to face Carl Mays, who was one of the few hurlers to throw underhand. In the fifth inning, the Indians' Ray Chapman was up to bat with Cleveland leading 3-0. The star shortstop had a 1-1 count, but what happened next shocked everyone in attendance. Mays threw Chapman high and inside, but Chapman couldn't get out of the way in time. He received a shot straight to the head and suddenly fell to the ground. Although Chapman was able to regain consciousness for a short time, he passed away early the next morning in the hospital. Ironically, Stan was the starting pitcher that day, so all the guys must have been tough, but for him to go back, Stan to go back on the mound, and try and pitch effectively. We won the game knowing that Chapman was really hurt. They didn't know how badly, but they knew it was really serious to finish the game. That was quite an accomplishment. Let's go back many years. Let's go back to 1920 and that eventful World Series I know you'll never forget and something that I read about and it gives me an honor to talk to you about it because you were the man. You were just about the whole show, I would say. 
uh, with your pitching. Now, I understand you pitched three consecutive games in a row in the World Series. Was it against Brooklyn, I believe? Against Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, were you scared when you, you pitched those three no, games? No, I wasn't scared, and I didn't know any. In the first ball game I pitched, I pitched, I pitched 72 balls in the first game. I pitched 78 in the second. I pitched 82 in the third. But it shows you what you can do if you have control. Did you ever have uh, much trouble? against the great hitters of our time, say Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and Ty Cobb. No, every one of them fellas had a weakness. I never seen a ball player that didn't have a weakness. If you have control, you can pick through the weakness and you have no trouble at all. He won games one, four, and seven of the World Series, and seven was the greatest. It was a 3 nothing complete game shutout. 1920 was the greatest year of his life, and yet he said the only thing that he appreciated about Cleveland was throwing to his catcher, Steve O'Neill, who was also uh, a anthracite product. So the only thing that I could gather is that he didn't like Cleveland uh, because his wife passed away, and he felt an awful lot of pressure playing baseball. He called baseball a very worrying thing because he worried before his first start, he worried during the start itself, and he worried after the start. Uh, and I think that says something about his uh, anthracite background, too, because when he was growing up, you didn't know, you know how long your job was going to last, or you didn't know, you know where you're going to get your, your next dollar from. We're talking about life in its very basic essentials. And I think one of the reasons why people from the anthracite region who have made it big have succeeded is because of negative motivation. Stan would not be the only Kowaleski to make it to the majors. His brother Harry had a nine-year career in the major leagues, pitching for the Philadelphia Phillies, Cincinnati Reds, and Detroit Tigers. In his rookie year with the Phillies, Harry established the nickname Giant Killer as a result of defeating the New York Giants three times in five days to deny the Giants of the 1908 National League pennant. Although both Harry and Stan had overlapping careers and their respective teams met multiple times, the two brothers never took part in a head-to-head -head pitching matchup. They had a mutual agreement to never pitch against one another. Harry found himself eventually coming home to Schmokin after his playing days. In 1926, he began a four-year stint with the Schmokin Police Force. After leaving the squad in 1930, he operated a cafe, but was fined for serving alcohol in violation of the prohibition laws. To pay off the fine, Harry took a job as a watchman in a silk mill, eventually earning enough money to once again open up his own place, a tavern he called the Giant Killer. Harry Kowaleski passed away on August 4, 1950, at the age of 64. He was buried in St. Stanislaus Cemetery in Shimokin. After the 1920 World Series, Stan went on to pitch four more years in Cleveland. Eventually, Kowaleski was traded to the Washington Senators and finished his final year with the Yankees in 1928. Kowaleski ended his career with a total of 215 career wins and a lifetime .602 winning percentage. Kowaleski was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1969 and sits among the best ever to play the game of baseball. For a guy that was commonly known as the Silent Pole due to his Polish heritage and quiet personality, Stan's presence is still felt by many today. At Progressive Field, the current home of the Cleveland Indians, Stan's career is remembered in Heritage Park, located in center field of the ballpark. There is also a section directly behind home plate that displays Stan's image. There are also multiple locations in the ballpark dedicated to the 1920 World Series championship team, including the right field gate entrance, a pennant in right field, and a specially themed suite behind home plate dedicated to the 1920 team. While in Cleveland, we also had the chance to visit League Park, the site of the 1920 World Series. Today, the historical field has been turned into a museum and includes a turf baseball diamond for various youth leagues. The new field matches the exact dimensions of the original field, and pitchers today could take the mound exactly where Stan Kowaleski once pitched. After his playing career ended, Kowaleski retired to South Bend, Indiana, where he was active with local baseball teams. 
He also owned and operated a gas station in South Bend and was said to give kids pitching lessons in the parking lot. The minor league stadium in South Bend, which is home to the single-A affiliate of the Chicago Cubs today, was named after him when it was built in the 1980s. Outside the stadium, baseball fans can still find a life-size bronze statue of that Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. After his death, March 20th, 1984, Kowalewski was buried in the city's St. Joseph Catholic Cemetery. I think coming up in this kind of atmosphere where you had to fight for everything that you got. And Kowalewski, there's of course the stories about him working uh, six days a week, 12 hours, hours a day for a nickel, $3.75 a week, and wanting to play baseball so badly that he went home at night and threw rocks against tin cans. That desperate desire was, you know, provided him with, with the metal and the determination to become the pitcher he became. What advice, and I, I'm sure you must have a lot of it, but what advice do you have for a youngster who loves to play baseball and hopes one day that maybe they can be another Stanley Kowalewski? Well, I believe, I don't care if you're an outfield or infield or what you are, if you throw a ball, try to hit something. Pick an object out to hit it. It's no use throwing a ball, it don't, don't mean anything to you. And when you have to pick an object out, you're forcing your arm, and you're stretching your arm more, and you get more speed. You've really got to practice and practice a lot of hard work and no other way, I guess. Well, you've got to keep at it all day. You, you can't just play once, twice a week. You've got to be at it all the time. In other words, you never give up. You keep on you trying. never give up. Right. <laughs> I know you'll always be an inspiration uh, to the young boys in the Shemokin and Cole Township area. And uh, I, I think now they have a thought when they go out to play baseball. It's not just for the fun of it. I think they can look forward to maybe uh, practicing hard enough and maybe throwing a stone. Well, they got more chance. You take them, just as I told you, this boy is getting seventy thousand dollars to sign a contract. Now they don't know if he's going to pitch a ball game or not. Uh -huh. I don't or nobody else. But it's the same with any. They all got a chance if they just have the action and go in and work hard. They all got that. Mr. Kovaleski, I think you've proven that they have a chance, especially yeah, to the boys from this area. It just goes to prove that uh, someone from a small town, if they work hard enough. Can, can get some place, the place where they want to be. Right, and you have proven that. Mr. Kowalewski, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and thank you so much. Well, thanks for being on. Thank you very much.